On a magical sunny day, somewhere on the outskirts of a beautiful city, a young man is hammering a nail and rejoicing that his building has been completed. We see a beautiful building with a restaurant sign on it. Our hero starts crying because he finally opens his restaurant after 15 years. Our hero's name was Allison, who was also a ninth grade archimage. 15 years ago, our hero was coming home from school as usual, he starts yawning because he was late for practicing cutting food, but before he knew it, it was already very dark outside. Our hero really liked cooking, so he enrolled in a school with a culinary bias, and he was going to become a first-class cook and open his own restaurant. With these thoughts, the hero was crossing the pedestrian, but to him at the meeting drove all the favorite trucks in, which hit him. When Allison opens his eyes, his head starts to split open and he doesn't realize where he is. Holding his hand over his head, behind him everything was ablaze with fire, and in front of him everyone was fighting a huge dragon. As it turned out later, our hero found himself in a fantasy world. Looking at everything that is happening, the hero realizes that this place turned out to be far from peaceful. And then Ella is grabbed by some man, from which the hero begins to get scared. The hooded man tells our guy that he needs to evacuate as soon as possible, because he can die here. Everyone lines up at the shelter and Allison asks the man with the mustache where they are. The man looks at our guy and notices he's dressed strangely, but says this is the back of the Ruburn Empire, and he never thought the Scarlet Dragons would come this far and attack them. Allison looks at the devastation and fire everywhere and realizes that the world he has fallen into is full of monsters and magic, not realizing what's going on here. And it's a good thing people here adapt quickly. But still, our hero needs to accept what's happening as soon as possible. Allison is thinking positive thoughts. He almost got hit by a truck, so this is his second chance. And then he thinks about the fact that now he won't have to take exams and he won't have to join the army. And then he thinks maybe he won't have to join the army here. And then a man on a horse appears on the horizon, asking for everyone's attention. He holds up a piece of paper and says it's an imperial decree. And then he says, citizens of the Ruburn Empire, the fate of the nation hangs in the balance. Mercenary wars have fled and knights have fallen in battle. There is no longer any escape from the dragons. Therefore, all of them will have to stand up to defend their country. After all these words, all the people are excited. But only Allison doesn't understand what this is all about. And then the same man tells everyone that the Emperor has ordered them all to fight to the death. And everyone starts screaming and cheering even more. And that's when a clearly frustrated Ellison began to realize that he had come into this world in the middle of a war with dragons. And since the country's army was depleted and the Empire relies on contract laborers, the government had to institute conscription. A bald man asks Ellison if he has any relatives of noble or knightly descent. But the hero doesn't understand at all how this could have happened to him. Then it turns out that men between the ages of 17 and 45, regardless of their origin, were automatically assigned to the knight's army. The bald man realizes that our hero has no such relatives, so he asks him not to hold up the line. Allison entering the room sees that some were also unhappy with their fate, and some have already resigned themselves to it. The next day, the commander asks the soldiers to salute, and Ellison, through his tears, thinks he'd rather be hit by a truck than by this army. And since our Ellison had some pretty good potential, the commander informs him that after his training, he'll be going into the magical forces. In the cafeteria, everyone is served local food that looks like thick swamp water that had rotten potatoes in it. But still tasting this food, Allison thinks that being a magician is better than mindlessly swinging a sword. And then our hero becomes uncomfortable after such a terrible taste. But for others, this food is not bad at all and even tasty. Allison is shocked by his comrades, as he does not understand how it can be delicious. And then he sees his comrade in arms imbibing this semblance of food and he gets a brilliant idea. Allison thinks about what if he opened his own restaurant here. Practicing with everyone else, Allison can't help but think that here he can realize his dream. Practicing magic, Allison thinks that dragons are just beasts and his service will be over in two years and he'll just have to be patient for a little while. But Ellison didn't know that his service would last not three or even four years, but fifteen years. And thinking about it, Allison wonders, would he have been able to keep his spirit alive if he had known he would serve fifteen years? But still, the time, it's gone by pretty quickly. The scene changes to a marvelous town called Greek. The girl notices some new building and wonders if there was a store here. But suddenly, she notices our hero, who is standing and crying as he has finally finished building his restaurant. 
and the girl realizes that our guy has been holding all these feelings in himself for a very long time. She walks up to him and asks him if he's okay. Allison turns around wiping his tears and says everything is fine, he's just very happy that he finally opened his restaurant. The girl was surprised that it was the owner himself, and then introduces herself, saying her name is Reyna. Allison extends his hand and introduces himself as well, saying it's nice to meet you. Reyna starts asking Ellison how long has he been here and did he come alone? Ellison says he's not here alone, and he's been in this place for a while. And then he says that he has a significant other, but he really likes to sleep and is unlikely to wake up until tonight. And at that moment we see a black-haired girl wrapped in a blanket. Then Reyna remembers that Ellison said something about a restaurant, so she asks him if he needs a meat vendor. And the hero informs her that he was just about to look for a butcher. Reyna tells Elle that her husband has a butcher shop on the left side of the alley at the entrance to town called Knoll's Butcher Shop. Ellison was very happy to hear this news, so he says he'll go there right away. But Reyna warns him that her husband can be very testy. If he gets angry, she tells Ellison to say you're from me. Ellison smiles and thinks Reyna is a very nice girl, then says he gets it. A little later, Ellison walks into the butcher shop and sees a menacing and big man, clearly not happy about Ellison coming to see him. At this point, Ellison is really scared and didn't know what to say. And then he starts mumbling that he has a small restaurant nearby, and this angry man has a butcher shop, so he's looking for someone. But the man immediately interrupts Ellison and says he doesn't sell meat, which Ellison doesn't understand at all. The man starts yelling at him again and says that he doesn't sell meat, and then says that all of you are like that, buying meat and then reselling it for three times the price. Allison scratches his head and thinks to himself that he didn't mean to do that. But the butcher stands his ground and says that our hero is just like everyone else. And then, butcher gets hit with something heavy. Reyna came to the butcher shop because she knew something bad was going on. She apologizes to Ellison for her husband. Her husband says he doesn't want to sell the meat because he's already suffered from people like him. Reyna starts yelling at her husband, but Allison at this point just wants to go home. Eventually, she sends her husband to get the meat, and then apologizes to Elle one more time and explains that she's been catering a restaurant for a long time as a contract worker, and he still can't get over how he was treated. Then Reyna marvels that Ellison is so young and already in the military. Ellison says that he's been through a lot and that 15 years of experience is not forgotten. Then the husband comes in and brings meat and tells our guy to show off his skills. Ellison looks in the sack and was clearly not pleased. That's when the man starts to get indignant about the fact that Ellison thought he was going to sell him great meat from Belorin. The man says he only sells that kind of meat to restaurants he trusts. And Ellison didn't think he'd get meat like this. And then a frying pan flies in the man's direction as he talks about Ellison making a decent dish. And if he doesn't like it, Ellison can forget about good meat. The man goes on to tell Ellison that he is a very picky eater. And then says that Ellison seems to be seriously frightened because his face was terrified. But as it turns out, the man's body was lying unconscious while his astral body was trying to reach our hero. And the cause of this event was Reyna, who had hit her husband with this frying pan, which had a huge dent in it. Allison is worried that Reyna hit him hard with the frying pan, but she says that Allison was not worried, because her husband is a nut. In the end, Allison agrees to cook him his coveted dish, which surprises Reyna. Allison tells them to come to his restaurant and he'll set it up. When Allison leaves, However, Reyna asks how will you cook something with this meat, asking if she can get you some Belorin meat? But Allison refuses, saying that this meat will be enough to make a delicious dish. Reyna looks at the sack of meat and tells the departing hero that it contains the fat of Yuba. As it turns out, in this world, cattle have different names. For example, cows are called Yuga, chickens are called Palenza, and wolves are called Belorin. But pigs are called Yuba. Allison pulls out the meat and says the guests will be here soon. Looking at the belly of the loss, Allison says it's time to start cooking. Allison looks at this meat carefully and thinks that now she understands why Mr. Creston is so proud of this meat, because it is the best. But Palenza, unlike chicken, is a very expensive ingredient. The cheapest meat here is Yuba, or in our language, pork, and the cheapest part is the belly. Looking mm. at the meat, Allison doesn't understand why this part is so disliked and then starts using fire magic to roast this delicious pig. The scene changes to a beautiful sunset where Reyna indignantly asks her husband about why he said he would only deliver good meat to trusted restaurants. After all, Allison is a good person. But the man replies to his wife that she doesn't know him to say that. 
But Reina says that she is not the person who is always being cheated, and these words clearly upset her husband. And Reina looks at her husband and tells him to admit that she just wants to see Ellison's cooking skills. And Reina seems to hit it right on the mark. And then he says he's very picky, and asks his wife what she'll do if he turns out to be a terrible cook. Reina says, what are you going to do? And the man walking down the path alone says he'll give him half of what she asked for. The scene changes to a fearsome orc screaming at the top of his lungs, hitting a soldier with his huge club, whose mouth is bleeding. A lot of people have fallen on this battlefield and the commander, looking at this madness, tells everyone to retreat as there are too many monsters. Then one of the soldiers screams for help as he can't get out from under the rubble as his leg is stuck. The orc swings his club while this poor guy is sobbing at the top of his lungs saying he's here. And when help was nowhere to be expected, a mage arrives and uses a spell, the Blade of Cyril. And then a bright light flashes, blinding all enemies and comrades. The orcs begin to growl unhappily at having their plan of carnage thwarted. Soon the rocks begin to rise up and the man under the rubble has been rescued. Everyone turns around and is delighted to see Mr. Ellison. As it turns out, at the time Ellison was a great magician who came at the right moment to save his comrades. Returning to the present, Allison summons a sirloin blade to give the meat a good cut, which helps to improve the flavor of the seasonings, and during roasting, excess liquid evaporates and makes the meat crispier. Finally done cooking the meat, the first customers enter the restaurant, in the form of Reina and her husband. Allison asks them to be seated wherever they want, as the dish is almost done. Reina was very pleased with the place, it was clean and cozy. But her husband thinks it's just a show off and nothing more. But Reina pulls out her PUBG pan and tells her husband to stop nagging and just wait for the food and her husband has no choice but to agree in front of such an ironclad argument. Allison begins his cooking. He pours oil on the hot stove and then lays a whole piece of Yuba's meat on it and then waits for all the moisture to evaporate from that meat. Ellison sees his meat cooking, and from that sound of the oil sizzling, it's like an angelic chorus to him. With tongs, he flips the meat so that each side is fried to a golden crust. After that, he adds salt and seasoning and then bakes the meat well inside. After that, he slices it into bite-sized pieces. He also makes a small salad. Allison thinks that perhaps this combination is unknown to the locals, and a hot sauce could be added to emphasize the juiciness of the meat. But since Mr. Creston seems to be very picky, Allison thinks not to take any chances with the hot sauce. After the salad was done, it was time to put everything on the plate. And now, the roast pork and salad can be served. While serving this dish, Reina notices how wonderful it looks and it even impresses our picky eater. Reina tastes the meat and can't believe how good it is, she can't believe she sees pigs running towards her. In the end, she can't believe it was belly fat because it's so delicious. But Allison says it was. Reina was pleased and now Allison thinks he can supply meat to his kitchen. He asks Mr. Creston how he likes the food, but sees that Creston just took all the food, leaving his plate completely empty. Gritting his teeth, Mr. Creston says they have no more meat. And then he hits the table with his fist, and the hero doesn't realize if the customer is satisfied or not. Creston says he's not satisfied and he wants more and more of this food. And Reina hits him again with her frying pan. Creston grumbles a little bit, but still stands up and says this is the best dish he's ever tasted. And from now on, he would supply only the best meat in the Ruburn Empire especially for Ellison, to which Ellison was very grateful. And then with a firm handshake, they conclude the contract between the restaurant owner and the butcher. And then Creston again asks him to bring him as much meat as possible. And meanwhile, the sleeping girl was still lying in her bed, but then she gets up because she smells the delicious smell of food. The scene changes to early evening where we still see Ellison's restaurant the same way. In it are guests who want two more servings of Yuba's belly and they seem to really like the meat. Ellison happily serves them their entrees and they were devoured in the same instant. Leaving the diners satisfied as they really enjoyed the food and especially the Bell Lorena meat. Allison is at the restaurant, thinking it's time to start cleaning up, but notices that his spices and seasonings were already too little. And everyone knows how important spices and seasonings are in the world of cooking. But luckily for Allison, he knows how to fix the problem. He takes out a gold coin, starts drawing a magic circle and puts the gold coin in the center, and then starts reciting the spell that made that bright blue light appear. His eyes start to sparkle and the room fills with bright light. And after that, everything you need to cook appears. There were a few spices and various sauces. As it turned out, 
Allison had developed this magic quite by accident when he was trying to return to his world, and any magic is good if you use it. Still, there are size and weight restrictions here, but this technique is very useful. But watching everything summoned, Ellison wishes he could move home as easily as this pepper box. He sends one gold coin for delivered food, but unfortunately the meat, eggs, and vegetables spoil on the way. Also, this magic takes a lot of energy, so after this summoning, Allison just collapses from fatigue. And even for a ninth grade archimage like him, one summon a day is the limit. Ellison then opens his refrigerator to have a can of beer, as he is very tired but notices that the fridge was empty. And then in anger, he yells Lurin. And we see the same girl from the second floor, who is currently asleep with beer bottles lying around her. Allison hits her on the head, but she doesn't realize what she did wrong. Allison shows the empty can and asks how could she drink all the beer, especially since she didn't clean up. But Lurin says it's because Allison didn't leave her any goodies, because when he woke up and went downstairs, there were only leftovers. Lurin cries out that she's a dragon, and dragons aren't suckers for cleaning up. But that only makes Ellison angry and he gives her a couple of slaps again, and then orders her to peel her bow and clean up after herself. Lurin starts cleaning her bow and cries, either from the bow or from being beaten, and then just says she's a dragon. Allison looks at this girl and thinks about how she really is a dragon, but now she's in human form. When there was a war with the dragons, Ellison accidentally stumbled upon her when she lost her mother and lost her lair. So he couldn't leave her there, and now he cares for her. And though you can't tell from her, she's lived for hundreds of years. Then Allison decides to take pity on Lurin and tells her to finish cleaning and he'll make her sty for dinner, so there's no reason to be offended. And Lurin was very happy that Allison promised her steak. And then, Ellison notices Creston walking into his restaurant, and from the look on his face, he's in trouble. Creston asks for something strong and Allison asks him to wait a minute. Looking in the refrigerator, Ellison sees that all the beer has been drunk by Lurin. So he decides to serve Creston something else. Serving hard liquor and meat, Creston wonders, what is this? Water? Allison says it's not water, but it's really good too. This drink is called soju. Creston holds up a glass of soju and it smells kind of weird, but still decides to try it and then snacks on the meat. Creston then wonders how good it tastes, because the drink has made the meat taste different. Creston tells Ellison that he's a great cook, and then asks for another bottle. And Allison notices that Mr. Creston is looking a little strange today and that something's wrong. Time after time, Creston asks for another bottle of soju, but Allison says he's had enough, as the drink is quite strong. But Creston says he has to get drunk tonight. Ellison wonders why Creston needs to get so drunk, so he asks him about what happened. Creston lowers his head and then says it's about rain. The atmosphere heats up and with a heavy expression on his face, Creston tells Ellison that Reyna probably has another man, which immediately shocks Ellison. Creston starts talking about how she's said a couple times that she needs to go out, but now it happens all the time. Every month she dresses up. And then he says that one day I decided to go after her since it had been going on for months, and what he found out shocked him. The man she was with was his former battle buddy. To him, this person was his close friend, but after Creston opened the butcher shop, they never saw each other again. And now it was clear to him why that had happened. He must have been embarrassed to look Creston in the eye, since he was preoccupied with Reyna. And then gritting his teeth, Creston says that she left again today and she probably doesn't love him anymore. Allison looks at him and says that a bottle won't help, but Creston says he doesn't know how to get through it all. Creston closes his eyes and touches his hand to his face and then says to Allison, you know what the funny thing is? I still love her. Because despite all of this, he still can't be without her. So he doesn't understand what he should do now. Allison looks at a grief-stricken Creston and decides to help him. Even though they haven't seen Reyna in a while, he doesn't think she's the kind of person Creston described, so he asks him to wait a bit. The scene then shifts to Lurin, who is still peeling onions and in tears, as well as saying that Ellison is an idiot. Soon Allison comes up to her and tells her to finish up because there's something she needs to do. And then tells Lurin, well, if you want, you can stay to peel onions. But Lurin immediately agrees to go along with him. Being in the center of the night city, people are partying and dining in luxurious establishments. And Lurin is impressed that the restaurants here are very crowded, not like some people's. And those words clearly hurt Ellison's feelings. Soon they notice Reyna and a man with white hair and Reyna was clearly upset about something. As they look at the man, 
Allison remembers Creston saying that he was his battle buddy. Allison calls out to Lurin and asks if she sees that woman, and then asks to overhear the conversation between that woman and that man. But Lurin asks Ellison if he will give her a steak if she does, and Ellison says he'll give her two whole steaks and Lurin agrees. She starts to use her powers and hears about Reyna asking the man sitting next to her about telling her husband everything. As it turns out, this man with white hair was named Mant. Reyna talks about how her husband is beginning to suspect them, as he is sad that Mant doesn't come into their butcher shop anymore. Mant begins to think about it and says he can't come in like this, because if Creston finds out about his help, he'll treat him even worse. After hearing all these words, Ellison is surprised and he thinks it doesn't sound like a business meeting. He then jumps off the roof, since he doesn't need to know anymore, and also tells Lurin to go home. Ellison is behind them, listening to Reyna say they did it to save their marriage, but then Ellison comes closer and asks if he can intervene? And Ellison's appearance really surprised Reyna and Minta, and Ellison just says that Creston does have a lot of suspicions. While at Ellison's restaurant, Creston is lying on the table as he has had a lot to drink. Suddenly, he notices Mant and his wife Reyna walk through the door. Mant looks at his friend with sad eyes and says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Creston gets up from the table and clearly very angry, and says that Mant and Reyna look very good together. But Reyna tries to explain everything to Creston, that it's not what he thinks it is. Clenching his fist, Creston is furious that he believed his friend. And then he lashes out at his friend. Mant clamped his eyes shut expecting a blow from Creston. But a barrier appeared in front of him, saving him from Creston's blow. Mant was surprised that he was still in one piece. And Reyna was also surprised that it was the barrier's magic. Then Allison shows up as well, asking Mant if it might be best to clear things up. Allison walks into the restaurant and holds up the food, and also says that aggression won't solve anything. After all, they should just say that Mant lent money to Creston to open a butcher shop. And those words immediately make Creston freeze in place. Creston turns around and asks Ellison to repeat what he said, but Ellison just tells them to sit down at the table and talk while he prepares food for everyone. Allison gets everything ready to cook since Creston has been drinking all day, so Allison wants to make him a restorative soup for his digestion. And since Reyna brought Bellerin's special meat, we can make Saibu Saibu. Shabu Shabu is a dish of thinly sliced meat and vegetables served with a sauce. Allison wants to prepare several sauces, but the main one will be soy sauce. And when the broth is ready, the anchovies will need to be rinsed and placed in the pot. And when Allison finished his preparations, the shabu shabu was ready. And at the same time, Allison hoped they had gotten rid of their misunderstandings. A little while later, Creston couldn't believe what his wife said, that man had lent them money. Reyna sighs and says that after the deception he had no money left, and Mr. Mant gave them most of his savings. And when the butcher shop began to bring in a steady income, Reyna began to see Mant to repay the debt. Creston can't understand how this happened. After all, the money was given after the cheater was caught, and then realizes it was a lie. Mant asks Creston if he would have taken the money if he'd told the truth, and then apologizes for not being there to congratulate him on opening the shop. He simply had no choice, for if the truth were to be revealed, he would end up a cheat. But Mant didn't realize that Creston was having such a hard time right now. A frustrated Creston asks Mant about whether he didn't have plans after his resignation. Oh, and how could he give away so much money? And that's when Allison cuts in, which causes these two to start staring at him intently, and Allison says that vegetables take a long time to cook, so kinda yeah. Anyway, they start evaluating the dish and Mant is surprised that the meat is so thin. Allison tells them that it's Belloran meat from Creston's shop, and he sliced it thin on purpose because it's only served with soup. Then he asks everyone to try his dish. Everyone pours a portion of food into their cups, and Mant tastes it, amazed at how good it is. He holds the food out to Creston for him to taste. And when Creston tastes it, something awakens in him. A memory that Mant is about to tell us about. Mant tells us that Creston sacrificed himself to save him. And he remembers that day very well. They had run out of provisions, and the fight had gone on too long. And all they had left to eat was a lean and unpalatable soup. And that's when Mant caught Belloran. But he caught only one, and he immediately collapsed on the floor. The soup they made was bland and the meat was tough. But it was still amazing. Creston, <sighs> barely containing himself, confirms Mant's words. And then Mant says, You asked me why I helped you despite my plans. But it turns out Mant didn't have any plans. After all, the only thing he wanted to do was to help Creston. Hearing these words, Creston, 
unable to hold back his tears, begins to cry and apologize. And he's really sorry. But this dish really warms the soul. A little later, Lurin wakes up and is outraged that she hasn't been fed yet, and you have to keep your promises to dragons. Ellison sighs and says it's not evening yet, and he'll make steaks for her. But Lurin still stands her ground, since it's nighttime, and based on their agreement, she demands food immediately. But at that moment, Ellison is called out by Mant. Ellison turns around and asks him if he liked the food. Mant replies that it was awesome, but he came to ask him something. As it turns out, he and his squad had recently been instructed to escort a rather high-ranking person and they all wanted to celebrate with a dinner before they left. So Mant asks if that dinner can be held at this restaurant, and Ellison shuts up, as he's going to have to make dinner for the whole squad. The scene changes and we see Allison running after someone in the woods, and he doesn't seem to be having much success. As it turns out, all this time he was trying to catch a local chicken, which is called Palenza here. It is considered a very rare bird and is highly prized. The moment Ellison does meet his eyes with this chicken, he thinks about just burning down this forest, as he is very tired of chasing this overgrown chicken. But unfortunately, he chose the meat of this bird for the celebratory dinner that Mant was talking about. A little earlier, uh -huh. Creston asks, so you want to know about Palenza? And then says that if such a bird existed, the person who caught it would be able to bathe in gold. Allison gets upset that Creston's butcher shop doesn't have such meat. And then with a sullen look he says that he was told they'd get any meat for him, so he asks Creston where his confidence went. And these words, of course, make Creston angry, so he calls him a little shit. But then he decides to tell Ellison that Palenza was recently seen in the Lemon Forest. And that's why Ellison went into the woods to get the chicken. But still it was difficult for Ellison, even though he's kind of a ninth grade Archimage, so I don't understand how he didn't catch that chicken. But still because of desperation, he asks Lurin to deal with this chicken. Lurin looks at the chicken and agrees, but in return asks Allison to do the dishes in her place. With no other choice, Ellison agrees. Meanwhile, Lurin gives off an eerie dark purple aura that clearly scares the chicken. And then, Lurin then uses Dragon's Growl, whereupon Palenza gets scared and puts away the brickyard and just passes out afterward. Lurin then also brags about his power, saying that Ellison would have passed out too if he hadn't absorbed the dragon heart. But all Ellison is interested in now is this sweet chicken that he's going to make for dinner, and then says that it's nothing to him since he could absorb 15 dragon hearts like that. While at the restaurant, Lurin sips a can of beer, happy that this is what he needs after a good day's work. But Allison, while cutting up the chicken, says that Lurin was just watching on the sidelines. Lurin resents it, saying it wasn't easy, since her eyes were burning at this point. Allison says okay okay okay, and then asks her not to drink too much beer, as they need to leave some for the guests. Allison places the Palenza meat in a deep bowl and then pours milk into it, as this dish will pair perfectly with the beer. That same evening, the guests have already gathered and there are many of them, there is a friendly atmosphere around, and someone even says that it might not be good, as he doesn't trust Mant. But Mant's very young companion, named Miltine, says he believes Mant and everything he says. And he's sure it'll be delicious. And Bald Man laughs at him, saying that the land will be good for him, too, if Mant says so. But the boy doesn't like what the Bald Man says about him. Mant tells them to stop, and they'll talk after the food arrives. Oh. Allison comes over to the table with the chicken palenza, and Mant asks them to forgive them for making such a big fuss. But Allison says it's okay since it's a holiday. Mant then introduces Miltane, who says he's heard a lot about Ellison's restaurant, since Mant has been praising it so much. Ellison smiles and serves the food, saying that he'll be very happy if the guests are happy with the food. Upon seeing the KFC legs from another world, Mant and especially Miltine are thrilled at how delicious it looks. Ellison informs them that it's Palenza meat and Miltine can't believe that Ellison has caught the very legendary creature that even the pros can't catch. But for Ellison, it was a no-brainer. But we all know that Lurin caught this chicken, that's why Ellison was so nervous about talking about it and then told them to start eating before it gets cold. Everyone starts tasting it and they all get all excited, how delicious it was. So good that Miltine swallows the chicken whole in his mouth. And the bald Ooh. man asks Miltine to leave some for him, while Allison goes to serve the other tables. A little later, a tired Ellison walks into the kitchen and asks Lurin to help him, since there are so many people in the room. But Lurin doesn't realize if Ellison is really talking to her, the dragon who caught that legendary creature that even the most experienced hunters can't catch? 
And then Allison realizes that Lurin has heard their conversation, and then tells her that if she doesn't want to do it, she doesn't have to do anything, but tells her not to forget that after the war they decided to open a restaurant together. And they also swore to each other that they would work hand in hand, but it seems people change very quickly. And he remembers those times with a light sadness. And left with no choice, Allison asks Lurin to go and do what he wants, since he can handle it himself. But at this point, Lurin quickly changes his mind and agrees to help Ellison, as serving guests is sure to be a lot of fun. And as it turns out, this was Ellison's plan to get Lurin's conscience to wake up and start helping. All the people in the restaurant were drinking beer and eating chicken, and Lurin was as a waitress, serving everyone's food. And when the feast was over, Lurin falls without strength on the table and just wants to go to sleep. But Allison what? comes in with mugs of beer and a delicious chicken, so Lurin gets up to enjoy the delicious food. Lurin thinks this meat is awesome, which makes Ellison very happy. But he doesn't understand why Lurin cleaned up the restaurant, since he didn't ask her to do that. Lurin rested his head on Allison's shoulder and looked out the window, telling him that this was our restaurant. The atmosphere at that moment was so warm that nothing seemed to break it. Lurin sensed that someone was approaching the restaurant, so she hid behind Allison. When the door started to open, Ellison looked around and recognized the person, and from the look in Ellison's and Lurin's eyes, this person was very familiar to them, and not in a good way. As it turned out, it was a black dragon, Meditin's elder, who is against humans saying his name. Allison asks what brought him here, while at this point Lurin was hiding behind him, and the dragon wonders if Allison and the dragon are doing well in this shack. And Lurin clearly doesn't like the old man. Allison asks him what he wants. Have you come for Lurin? After all, as far as he knows, no one objects to Lurin being with Ellison. But Starkey looks angrily at Ellison and says his tongue is as sharp as ever, but still agrees with Ellison's opinion that he came for Lurin. Lurin grits her teeth and says she's staying here, asking, what are you going to do? After all, you already left me once. But the old man tells Lurin that he didn't leave her, he was just too late. And just when he was about to tell her that her mother committed a terrible sin, he is interrupted by Allison, asking him if he remembers their promise? Because as far as he knows, dragons don't mess around with that kind of thing. And this old man, he says he's just here to discuss that promise. They did trust Lurin to Ellison to take care of her. But there's another promise that was made first. But Ellison doesn't understand what it's about. And then the old man explains that in the Black Dragon Clan, the age of 800 is considered the threshold of adulthood. But a dragon without a lair becomes a ward by the age of 800 and goes to the sacred lands. And since Lurin lived in her mother's lair, which was destroyed, the old man with an evil grin says that next year, when Lurin turns 800, she will have to go to the sacred lands. After all, those are the rules of the clan and no one is allowed to break them. And breaking the rules would start a war. Then Allison sighs and says, what's the big deal? Which stuns the old man, because he didn't expect such audacity and chutzpah from Ellison, making the place fill with a terrifying aura. But Ellison stands his ground and asks, do I have a choice? And Lurin calls out to our hero, clearly hinting to him that he should not express himself like that in front of the black dragon. And these words immediately enrage this old man, making him show his razor sharp teeth. And then with a terrifying aura tells him that although you have consumed the heart of a lord, you are being too impertinent. Lurin realizes that something terrible could happen now, so she tells Ellison that she's fine, and as it is, war is not an option. Huh? But from the look on Ellison's face, he doesn't realize what war could be, because he was talking about the dragon's lair. And it's discouraging for Lurin and the old man. Ellison says they have a whole year, so why not build the lair in that time? And they can start right now. So he asks the old man if they can do that. And the old man, not knowing how to react, agrees and then leaves through the portal saying they'll see each other in a year. Then it turns out that the dragon's lair is a cave where dragons live. It should have a superb interior and dazzling treasures, as it is the symbol of the dragon's lair, but it takes a lot of time and resources to build such a lair. A little while later, people lined up outside Ellison's restaurant. People kept asking for food, but there were too many of them, and Ellison, even if he had Lurin, counted as one. As it turned out, there were rumors that his restaurant was serving Palenza, which was why it was so crowded. And even when he said that the Palenza was a limited edition dish, they didn't listen to him and started placing their orders. But Ellison can't take it anymore, so he has to come up with something to reduce the influx of guests. The scene changes where we see Creston looking at several Palenzas sitting in the trees, wondering what are these even. 
Allison says they are Palensu, but Creston doesn't understand why. And then Allison says he'll provide him with these Palenza. And Creston will own the only shop that sells such high-end meat. But Creston doesn't understand how Ellison is going to catch them, because even the best hunters in Greek can't do it. But Ellison tells him not to worry about it, and asks, Didn't you hear that man's troop tasted Palenza meat in my restaurant? And then says we can make a deal for half. Allison will supply the meat for free, so Creston gets half the proceeds. But Creston thinks that's too much, since Ellison himself has decided to capture them and bring them to him, so he doesn't understand why the whole half? But Ellison again says it's fair, and they won't make much anyway, so they can use this opportunity to sell other meat, and then ask Creston to buy his wife Reina a new dress. But these words only make Creston angry. But in the end, they agree to these terms. Creston says that Palenza often change their habitat, so Allison uses barrier magic to create a large dome so that they can hunt Palenza. Creston looks at the barrier and marvels at how huge it is. But it's not easy for a newcomer to build one, so Creston wonders who Ellison is. But Ellison just says he's a chef who's retired, just like Creston. So Ellison hopes his magical powers will remain a secret. The next day, Ellison's plan was executed perfectly and the hall had no guests and Ellison is happy about it. Lurin looks at Ellison and asks him if he is really so happy that they have no guests now. The atmosphere changes and Ellison realizes that he has done something stupid because he had hoped to have at least a couple of guests. But now they have time to build a den, which Lurin was very happy about, asking if they'll be living together when they build the lair. And Allison informs her that he's staying here. But Lurin doesn't like that, so she says she's going to start a war with the dragons, since she doesn't want to be without Allison. But Allison says they'll just build a lair somewhere nearby. And when Lurin calms down, Allison asks her to follow him. They go down to the bottom of the hill where their restaurant is, and he says that since the restaurant is on the outskirts, all the surrounding land belongs to him. And Lurin says she's fine with that distance for a den. But Allison says they'll have to dig, so they'll have to keep an eye on the inner barrier at all times or the ground will collapse. Lurin agrees and says it's time to start digging then, but Allison just tells her that he's going back to the restaurant as he can't leave it empty, which of course shocks Lurin as she'll have to dig alone. Allison is in the restaurant, enjoying the sunshine, and he hasn't had so much free time in a long time. But soon his rest is interrupted by a young boy with golden hair. Once inside, he apologizes and asks if this is the famous restaurant. Ellison greets him but says he doesn't know how famous it is, but yes, he came to the restaurant. The boy says he's heard that they serve paleo meat here. But Ellison clams up and says he's sorry, but they don't make that dish anymore, so he asks to look in Creston's shop. The guy starts looking around and says he can't and then asks Ellison if he has any other entrees? since he's really hungry. In which case, Ellison says if he's satisfied with another dish, let him sit down, and this kid thanks him. Using magic, Ellison realizes that this kid is from a well-to-do family who's just facing hardship, but Allison treats all his guests the same. And the only thing the kid likes is a hamburger, because he makes them so often for Lurin. Ellison uses magic to cut up the meat from Wokey's tenderloin to make a fine mince that is fried along with crispy buns that are fried in oil. But for the cutlet to be tasty, you need to salt it a bit and then lay the cutlets on top of the vegetables and drizzle with garlic sauce. Ah, actually I wouldn't mind a burger like that right now either, I'm so hungry. Anyway, at the end, Ellison adds a poached egg, and even though Ellison says he doesn't sell poached eggs anymore, he didn't say anything about their eggs. And then, the hamburger was ready, all nice and tasty and appetizing and I was drooling. The kids wondering if it's a sandwich. And Allison says almost, but not quite. And just as the kid tries to take a bite, a gray-haired man calls out to him, calling out a young gentleman. I mean, he's been looking all over for him and he's wondering what he's doing here. And he doesn't understand how he can eat in a place like this, and that he the young gentleman will get poisoned? So he asks him to follow him. And Allison was watching all this and he didn't like it. He didn't want to interfere, of course, but this was too much. The gray-haired man asks Ellison if he owns the place, and then says he's not sure Ellison knows who he was serving food for. Because it was the Lord's son, whose name was dire in Greek. Ellison starts a conflict with this man, saying that he doesn't care about titles, since he was just serving his guest, so he doesn't understand what's wrong here. And this really ticks off the man, who thinks it's very arrogant. And to calm everyone down, dire in Greek tries to calm them down by saying that everything is fine. So he leaves a gold coin, not knowing if it's enough, 
because he made Ellison cook and he didn't touch the food. And when they left, Ellison felt a kind of uneasiness. And then Lauren shows up, covered in earth because she's been digging alone for so long. She declares that she can't take it anymore and says it's Ellison's turn. Ellison says that's enough for today and he'll dig more tomorrow. But for now, he asks her to go after him. But Lurin doesn't understand what the big deal is since she just wants to eat. Ellison looks at the gold coin and says that he'll cook her something when they get home. Then, they head to the Lord's castle. We see Dyron sitting alone, but then he notices some sort of portal behind him. And out of that portal comes Allison and Lurin, who have brought with them the very burger he didn't get to try. Dyron was very happy to see this burger, and since Ellison had heated it up, it was safe to eat. Dyron was drooling from the smell and he had so many questions for Ellison, but he wanted to taste the hamburger first. But as usual they were interrupted by voices coming from behind the door, and Ellison was tired of this kid not being allowed to eat properly. Dyron is now shaking with fear and doesn't know what to do. Allison looks at him and says, like what? You have to say he's imagining things. He tells Dyron that he is the son of the local lord, so they just wouldn't dare go against your word. Dyron was very upset. He says they never listen to him and they ignore him all the time. The door continues to be knocked on and the man behind it says that he opens the door. Lurin starts to sigh and says that it's sad. And then starts yelling loudly that nothing happened, so just leave, and he didn't give permission to come in. And that's when Dyron realizes it was his voice. But still looking at the door he realizes that they won't listen to him. But the man behind the door said he understood, so he asked him to call if he needed anything. And Dyron was shocked that nothing happened and Lurin was very unhappy about it. Then Allison tells him to be a little more confident. But as a friend, Dyron bends the knee and asks Ellison to be his teacher. And Ellison standing there doesn't understand. Next we are told Dyron's story. His mom died during childbirth. His father soon remarried, so he spent most of his life with his stepmother. Sitting in a field by a tree, we see Dyron and his stepmother saying something about him breathing too loudly. His stepmother was very strict with him, she taught him to behave carefully, after all he is the son of a lord, but there were good things too, so he continued to love her. However, everything changed when her father became bedridden due to illness. At feasts and dinners together, she simply kept silent and averted her gaze. Dyron tells her that the servant still continued to do her bidding in the same way, controlling his every move, and so he was all alone. Allison is a little discouraged by this. And once Dyron thought that he wasn't going to be treated any better even after he became a lord. And then also looking at Ellison with excited eyes, says that today his opinion has changed. He asks his teacher to tell him how he can become a good lord. Ellison looks at him with a dumbfounded look and says it's all weird. And then says he's just a chef instead of a restaurateur. But Dyron still goes on to say that this has never happened before, because they used to just break into his room. Allison looks at this kid and thinks he's very insecure, and it feels like he's suppressing himself on purpose. But then he sighs and gets ready to give him some advice. He tells Dyron to always make eye contact when he talks to someone. After all, if he wants to become a good lord, he must realize that such a title comes with great responsibility. That is why it is important to teach him to take responsibility for his words. But this does not mean that one should ignore everyone. It is necessary to listen carefully and think before speaking. Looking at Dyron and saying all this, he also continues to say everything. If you're happy with the decision, that's great, but if you're not, you need to take responsibility. And Allison thinks that's the kind of skill a good lord should have. And while Dyron ponders his words, Ellison says goodbye to him and tells him to eat his hamburger before it gets cold, and tells him to stop by his restaurant, and then enters the portal and disappears. Dyron standing alone thinks it was just some kind of dream, but then looks at the burger and thinks about Ellison's words. Dyron takes a bite of the burger and realizes that it's really good, and then he gets a brilliant idea. He starts to realize and says that the good lord is the one who will make sure that everyone can enjoy this deliciousness. And now he's got it all figured out. Coming out of the portal Allison says to Lurin, hoping you don't take his words seriously. Lurin asks, what is it about that boy? Why do you even care so much about him? And then Ellison shows Lurin a gold coin and says that he had to work it off. Lurin looks at the gold coin and says that it's 100,000 runes and a regular hamburger costs 200, wondering, did he really pay that much? Ellison confirms that he did, so he gave him the appropriate service because he doesn't want to be a cheat. And Ellison hopes this kid will stop by more often because he has very generous hands. But Lauren is against it because there won't be any burgers left for her. 
The scene changes to a forest on the outskirts of the town of Grick. There is a fairly popular healing center there, and all the men are lined up to get in to see her. As she examines her hands, she says that this girl has a serious burn. As it turns out, it was Reyna, and she wasn't very careful while cooking. This healer says it's okay, good thing you stopped by to see me, and if the wounds aren't healed, it could leave a scar. Then we find out the reason why people have started coming here, and it's because the healing center is owned by an elf, not a human. And this elf healer's name was Elena, who uses healing magic on Reyna's hands. Reyna was surprised that her hand was completely healed, and she thanks her for being the best as always. But then Reyna sees that Elena is sad about something and asks what it is. Elena is silent, but then she says that she is thinking about going back to her home. And Reyna is shocked by this and asks why. Elena says with a sad look that she loved helping people, and despite all the general discontent, she left town, but it wasn't as she had imagined. For what she has realized is that few people are interested in treatment, and people go to her to see the elf. These men standing outside the window think she's a goddess and very beautiful. Elena then tells Rena what she was recently yelled at by a woman who accuses her of seducing her husband. Elena squeezes into her eyes and knows that not all people are like that and she still loves to heal, but yet she's already failing. Reyna thinks about it for a bit and then asks Elena, you don't like me either. Elena is a little shocked by this and says Miss Reyna is very kind and you have always treated me very well. Reyna then also asks, would you stay if you liked it here a little more? And Elena starts to think about it. Next, Reyna brings up her husband Creston. She says, I don't like some things about my husband either, he snores and is very naive, but she likes him a lot better. And she remembers him only with the kindest smile. She loves him for his independence, his caring and for his dedication. So Reyna asks Elena one more time. You said you still love to heal people, and Elena confirms that you do. And then Reyna also says that a restaurant has opened up on the hill, so check it out today. Elena doesn't understand what restaurant we're talking about, and Reyna says I don't have enough fingers on both hands to describe why it's worth a visit. And she's sure Elena will love Ellison's restaurant. The scene changes and we see Ellison, who is outside the cave. He is oh. called by Creston, who is just on his way back to his restaurant. Ellison tells him that he was going back too, but there is just some renovation going on, and then asks who is next to Creston. And Creston tells him it's his nephew, though not biologically. And then Nellan greets Ellison. Creston says that his nephew wanted to discuss something with him, so he just decided to do it over a plate of meat. And then they ask, is there no one in the restaurant there right now? But Allison says something to the effect that Rowan should be there, and why is that? Then Creston says that his wife Reyna recommended his place to a famous elf, and he thinks that she is already there. Allison, upon hearing this, thinks it's time to go back. You don't meet many elves. As they approach their restaurant, Allison talks about how they don't usually leave the wood shack, and she must be very popular. Creston starts to get angry for some reason and talks about not asking, and he's heard about all the guys running over to her and staring out the windows and pointing fingers. And he starts to realize why it is that elves avoid humans. But Ellison closes his eyes and thinks that not all elves are like that, and as he walks into his restaurant, he recognizes that this is still a very proud race. But then, we see the horrifying scene of Elena bowing down to Lurin. And then Elena says something that Lurin is the greatest being and she asks to be forgiven for being rude. Lurin looks at her with dragon eyes and says something that she will forgive her if she becomes her servant. And seeing this scene, Ellison was shocked to the core. And his hand starts to burn with anger, and Lorraine just says that she found an elf servant and smiles. And that's when Ellison starts yelling at Lauren and asks, is this how you behave with our guest? And standing outside Creston and Neelan doesn't realize what those sounds are, but it's best to wait outside. And then we are transported back in time, where Lurin meets Miss Elena, who asks if this is Mr. Ella's restaurant. Lurin informs her that it is his restaurant, but he is not here right now. And Lurin notices that Miss Elena was an elf. Lurin compliments the elf, saying that she is very beautiful. And Miss Elena reciprocates, saying that Lurin is also very beautiful, and looks even much younger than her. But this only makes Lurin angry, thinking about the fact that this pixie seemed to call her a little girl. Lurin tells this sassy Elphus that she is indeed young among dragons, but she would clearly be older than her. To which Ms. Elena was surprised. With a terrifying dragon aura, Lurin asks this Elphus how dare she open her mouth in her direction. Which shocks and horrifies Ms. Elena, and she immediately bows to her knees, and apologizes to her. And at the same moment, Al walks in and sees the scene of Ms. Elena bowing down to Lurin. 
Elena reiterates that Lurin is the greatest being, and she asks her to forgive her for being rude. And then Lurin says she will forgive her if she becomes a servant, which of course also shocks Ella. And building up rage in his fist, Al punches Lurin in the head, and then looks outside and asks the guests to come inside. After some Lurin cries out in pain, because she was in a lot of pain. And the elf was surprised at this behavior of this dragon. After all, as the rule is known to everyone from small to large, don't piss off a dragon for anything. They are a walking disaster that can sizzle an entire village if desired. They are at the head of all living things. Ms. Elena listened to a lot of legends about it as a child. However, this guy is acting like a child with a dragon, and she wonders who this man really is. Al approaches Ms. Elena and apologizes to her for what happened earlier. He didn't know about Lorene behaving this way in his absence. Ms. Elena stutters nervously and asks, Are you human? This surprises Ella, but he still says yes, he is human. And then thinks to himself that it was expected, but Lurin didn't even try to hide the dragon aura. He tells Ms. Elena, as you've already figured out, it's a dragon girl. And for sure it may seem strange that he lives with a dragon, but still, it's a long story. So approaching Ms. Elena's mission, he whisperingly asks her, can she keep this a secret? Elena had no choice, and of course she's not going to get involved with the dragons, as she still wants to live. Al is of course not happy about the situation, but says that Lurin won't kill her, and also thinks about the fact that Lurin made a terrible first impression on Ms. Elena. Then also Al asks this elf woman, you are Rena's healer, right? And the elf replies that it's true, and her name is Elena. In his head Al imagines that he was left a bad review, that Miss Elena visited this place on the recommendation of a friend, and she was made a servant and now she has terrible impressions. Meanwhile, Helena says that she heard that even the vegetable dishes here are good, so she decided to visit this place. Al smilingly says she'll cook whatever you order, and then asks, you can't tolerate meat, right? Elle informs her that she has no personal reasons about meat, it's just that her body doesn't digest meat. And Elle thought about the fact that any dish without meat would be fine for her. So after taking the order she says she'll cook something right away, and in the background Creston is still asking for Yuba's meat, and Elena says she'll wait for that dish. Al starts to say that there are a lot of non-local dishes, and he thinks tomato paste would be perfect. Al takes a skillet in his hand and then stirs the chopped onions, garlic, and mushrooms in it heated with olive oil, and because of this, an incredibly savory flavor will form. Then you also need to strain the tomato juice through a sieve and add it to the skillet and add salt, sugar, and spices of choice. Then turn down the heat, making sure the sauce doesn't burn. While the sauce is cooking, you can prepare the pasta. You need to cook them for 8 minutes and leave a little liquid at the bottom. At the end you just mix the pasta with the sauce and the tomato paste is done. Al serves the dish and Miss Elena was very surprised by the beauty of this dish. Al asks Miss Elena to use a fork and so that she doesn't worry, he didn't use any meat. Miss Elena was very impressed as it looks very appetizing. Elena twirls the tomato paste on her fork and then tastes it. In the meantime, Yuba's meat was ready. Al brings Yuba's meat to these two, and while Al was carrying this meat, Creston almost fell asleep while waiting. Creston asks Neelan to try the meat soon, as he will like it very much, but Al notices that Neelan looks sad, thinking that he might not like the food. And then also Al calls out to Elena, but when he looks back he sees a complete shock, he sees Elena swallowing more and more of that pasta. Her eyes were full of happiness, and her mouth was full of delicious food, because she had only eaten fresh vegetables before, and she didn't know that there was such delicious food. After emptying the entire plate, she exclaimed that it was just awesome. But Al seemed shocked at the sight of it, and it really embarrassed Elena. But Al, embarrassed, says it looks like you guys like the pasta. Elena, embarrassed closes her eyes and apologizes, but it was so good she couldn't help herself. Elle laughed and says it's no big deal, the important thing is that she enjoyed the food. Offering her a napkin he asks, you don't go to restaurants that often do you? With embarrassed and closed eyes, Eleni says that yes, it attracts too much attention, so she prefers to eat vegetables from the market. But still sometimes she thought about visiting a restaurant. But there aren't many places in their region that serve meatless food, and if they do, the dishes don't taste any better than vegetables. So she wondered why she needed it. Elle thinks about the fact that it is true, because here almost no spices are used and there are very few of them. And then Elena joyfully exclaims that Al's food made her change her mind. After all, the pasta was delicious, and Ms. Reina is to be thanked. And Al imagines in his head the praise that Helena left a review, and Al is happy to hear that the food was to Helena's liking. But then Al notices something is wrong. Creston asks Neelan to repeat what he just said. Neelan says he learned that his mother was not his own. The scene takes us to the mine. It was Neelan's mom who didn't understand where her son had gone. She asks the worker if he has seen Neelan. 
The worker says he hasn't seen anything, but the night shift guys have already gone into the mine. And Neelan's mother starts to worry, hoping he at least ate before work, and then asks if she can drop something off for him, and that's when Neelan's mom starts walking to the mine. Back at the restaurant, Creston asks Neelan who told him that. Neelan angrily pounded on his desk saying that it wasn't the most important thing right now, after all, he had been fooled for 20 years. He couldn't concentrate on his work, so he left early. And at that moment, Ms. Elena and Elle were sitting at the table and overheard their conversation. Neelan is talking about how he can't go home. And that's when Creston asks Neelan, do you have any idea what Mrs. May went through to raise you? After your father died, she worked days and nights to feed you. Asking, don't you think she's done a lot for you, even though you're not her own? And looking at Neelan, Creston says you should realize that yourself. Neelan says that he knows all this and it's all his fault, but this morning he was very angry. Early in the morning until Neelan's mother went to the mine, she had prepared lunch for her favorite son, asking him not to forget lunch. But Neelan only turned angrily and said she wouldn't need it, and then instead of saying mother he said the word woman. And those words really upset Neelan's mother. Creston grabs him by his clothes and can't believe what he just said, saying that you can't talk to your mom like that. Elle comes out from behind the table and says that this is not the way to do it and it needs to stop immediately. But just then, Raina runs into the restaurant and screams at Neelan. She talks about how terrible things have happened and for him to hurry to the mine as soon as possible. Raina tells Neelan that the mine collapsed on his mom and she is trapped there. Neelan looks at Raina and can't believe that something like that happened. Creston asks what happened and what's up with Mrs. May now. But Raina doesn't know that, but it seems she went inside to look for Neelan and then disaster struck. Neelan in confusion says no and then runs outside while Raina and Creston yell after him. They then announce that they have to go after Neelan and Elena asks if she can go with them. She says she'll probably need to help the injured. And Elle then also says she'll go with them. Raina looks at Ms. Elena, and then remembers what our elf said about how she knows that not all people are like that, and she still loves to heal them, but unfortunately she can't do it anymore. After finally realizing everything, Raina says that she will take everyone to the mine. While at the mine, Neelan tries to go inside, but is restrained by two men, saying it's dangerous. Then Elle and Miss Helena show up and say that they will save Neelan's mother, so everyone had better calm down. But one of the workers says that they can't go into the mine now because the situation is critical. But Al just says that this girl is a healer, and there are probably people in the mine who need help. After weighing all the pros and cons, Al and Elena end up in the mine. But Elena tells El that he didn't have to follow her because it's too dangerous. And when the debris started falling, El used barrier magic to protect himself and Elena, and then says that he knows magic and can stop the falling rocks, which immediately shocked Elena, since she didn't think El was a magician. El informs her that he was good in his youth, but now he is long retired. He then asks Elena, why did you go into the mine? Al says that he heard about Elena having her own healing facility, saying that he had a battle buddy who was also an elf. And El doesn't think Elena owns a healing center just because of race, and then stops and tells Elena that humans are probably rude to you, and you still went into the mine to save a human. So what's the reason? Elena is silent for a moment, and is about to say something, but she is interrupted by El, who notices that things are quite bad. They had two paths in front of them and now it's not clear which way to go. Realizing that they don't have enough time to go around both passages, El starts to read a spell, after which spheres of spirits appear. This spell Elena was very surprised that El controls the spirits. As it turned out, these spirits will tell if there are survivors. After a while, the spirit sphere found a survivor. The worker was puzzled by this blob of energy, thinking it was just a death hallucination. But how shocked he was when he saw the beautiful elf Helena, who came to his rescue. The worker had injured his leg, but luckily the wound was not that serious, so after a little treatment it would be possible to walk. The worker was grateful to Helena for her help, happy that she had come to his aid. And then the spirits found another person again. It was another old man, whom Elena had also healed with her magic. El used telekinesis magic to lift a huge rock so Elena could help the mine worker. And then people magically started flying out of the mine, much to the surprise of the other workers. Luckily for everyone, it was the last of the workers, but you could tell by the look on Elena's face that she had almost no strength left. It was then that Elle began to wonder if Neelan's mother wasn't here, but suddenly, they find her wounded and unconscious on the ground. As they get closer, Elle asks her how she's doing. Elena looks at Neelan's mother and says that things are bad, but she uses a strong spell, but promises nothing. Elena uses a powerful spell and the last of her strength just to help this poor woman. After a while, the people have made a temporary shelter for the wounded. Reyna at the same time wonders what they're going to do now. Creston reassures her that Elena's spell worked, so there's no need to worry. So Neelan's mother has to come to her senses. 
Neelan is sitting in front of his mother, clearly believing that he is to blame for everything that happened today. L asks Neelan to be calm, as Miss Elena has given first aid using a strong spell, so his mother's condition is now stable. But looking at Elena, you can't say she's doing well right now. Elena, who is now exhausted, says that Neelan's mother hit her head hard, but the treatment was successful. But the wound near his eye is not very serious, so after the bandages are removed, he will be able to live his life again. In the meantime, Neelan reaches for the basket of food and sees that it was the lunch his mother made. But Neelan also remembers the horrible words he said to his mom. And it upsets him, but at that moment Neelan's mother calls out to her son, which brings him to his senses. Everyone starts to rejoice, and Neelan looks at his mom with tears in his eyes, telling her that he is here, his son is here. His mother was worried about her son, but Neelan said he was fine. But he was very worried and scared for her. Afraid that those words he said in the morning might be the last words he said to her. But Nalina's mother was just glad that he started calling her mom again and then apologized to him for making him worry, but she was glad he wasn't in the mine. Meanwhile, Elena looks at L and says he's right that she wanted to close the asylum and go home, because she couldn't stand the horrible treatment. And that's when Mrs. Reina came in. Elena smilingly says that Reina said she should try to find the good stuff, and she must have found some good. After all, humans live much smaller lives than elves, but they have so much emotion in them. But that's why humans suffer so much. Elena says it's funny, but that was one of the reasons she decided to help people. So after blowing it all out good, she can't leave something she values so much. After all, she likes human sincerity, and now she also knows how good the food here is. And closing her eyes from fatigue, she says that today she realized a lot and then starts to fall. But at that moment, Elena is picked up by L, asking her to be more careful, which immediately makes Elena embarrassed. And then she starts to apologize to L, but L knows that Elena is overworked, so he asks her to wait a minute. And then he starts emitting his energy into Elena's body, which Elena was surprised by, because it was a mana transfer spell. L says that this spell was taught to him by an elf he knew, whose name was Beden. Elena was amazed because Beden was an elven hero. She doesn't understand how this happened, but L informs her that he has already mentioned that he used to be a famous magician. Meanwhile, on the hill where L's restaurant stands, Lurin is still poking around in her cave, complaining to L that he left her here all alone, all because she can't use magic in public. She just wanted to find them another servant though. And having said that, her face was suddenly in the water, and looking down she saw that it was some kind of water source that came straight from under the ground. L, coming to the place where the water source was, asked Lurin, so the water just came out of the water? And then you got curious and decided to dig further? Lurin proudly declares that she did. Meanwhile L is thinking to herself that she didn't do it on purpose, so you have to be calm. Lurin explains that she's been digging and digging, but she hasn't found anything. L informs her that there must be an underground spring somewhere. But even after Lurin has dug so much, it's still not enough, and there's nothing to be seen with magic either. And then storing up energy, L talks about the fact that a magical barrier will soon need to be created here, and Lurin remembers that L once talked about it. So L immediately starts to activate the spell, but Lurin warns him to be careful with his powers or he could fly off the hill. L uses a class 8 magic called Inferno which creates a huge explosion, after which water dripped from everywhere, while Lurin in the meantime created a huge magical barrier. And then a geyser erupted from where the water was. L was surprised by this, as the magic had opened up underground water. A hot spring to be exact. Lurin undresses and asks L to do it again so she can wash herself. L shouts to Lurin that the water is too hot, but it was too late and the water scalded our girl's face and she screamed like she was being boiled in a pot. After a while, Lurin sits there covered with a blanket and L tells her she can't do that. But Lurin indignantly says she didn't know the water was hot. And L says she probably should have warned her earlier, thus keeping the barrier down. Lurin at this time asks L, what are they going to do with the barrier now? L says it will just create a safe place for the water. All they have to do is lower the barrier a bit, the dirt will break up on its own and they'll have clean water. And then they'll just get rid of the top of the balloon. And now, the hot spring was ready, much to Lurin's surprise. And that very second, L picks up Lurin and throws her right into the spring. Once in the water, Lurin screams that she's very hot, saying she's going to boil, but then realizes that the water was warm. L starts to undress and says that he cooled her down. Upon entering the water, L felt very cold, and Lurin sat embarrassed. She then asked E where he went and where he had been. L says the mine collapsed today and he went to rescue people. But Lurin asks indignantly if he was with that elf woman. L feeling awkward says that they needed a healer since he's not very good at healing magic. That's when an offended Lurin realized why L came home so pleased. L doesn't understand what's wrong? 
and Lurin starts to resent the fact that she was digging in the ground and Elle was having fun with this nasty creature, saying she hates everybody but Elle, which made Elle have nothing but a stony and incomprehensible face on his face. Then Elle took the kettle and started pouring water into a mug. He opened a can of cocoa and added some to the mug, which made a delicious and flavorful drink. Elle offered this drink to Lurin and she asked what it was. Elle explained that it was cocoa. Lurin drank some and realized it was quite tasty. Making another cocoa drink, Elle asked Lurin if she liked it. And Lurin said it was sweet and quite tasty. Elle began to explain that cocoa is made from cocoa beans. The powder itself looks unsightly, but it takes a lot of time to grow the beans, drying, roasting, processing and more. Many people have worked on this cocoa powder. Then Elle says that his strength would be enough to blow up the mine, but he couldn't save a single person. Without Mr. Creston, Elle couldn't get the ingredients for the restaurant. He also says that he could create a huge space here, but he'd still have to call in the dwarves to build the lair. And then says that all races are different, so don't underestimate the people around you. Besides, even dragons wouldn't survive in a world without other races. Hearing all these words, Lurin looks at her mug of cocoa and says okay. But she will still treat El differently, since he's special to her. Elsewhere, there was a battle between Mant's group and the bandits. Mant asks everyone to stick together and they will definitely win. One of them yells to everyone not to let anyone get close to the cliff. Miltine fights in sweat, but Mant notices something suspicious. He is approached by a big guy, who Mant immediately chops up, shouting to Miltine that he is too far away. Miltine sees Mant's strength and understands his words. But then, behind Mant was one of the bandits who was ready to deliver the final blow. But Mant already knew this was going to happen, so he grabs this bandit by the arm and throws his axe away, and then stabs him with his sword, which makes the bandit start coughing up blood. But then, tells Mant that there's no way he's going to hell, alone. So the bandit and Mant fall off the cliff straight down, and Miltine starts shouting after him as Mant falls down. The next day, Elle builds a fence and the restaurant was closed for the day. Lurin asks why Elle decided to close the restaurant today. Elle says that because they drank cocoa, they are now out of milk. And he used the milk for the marinade, but there's very little of it left. So to make sure there would always be milk, Elle decided to build a farm. Lurin looks ahead and says there's nothing here. But L says you always have to start somewhere. And first they need the Berenric. And they live in the lower Varint River. Well, the new chapters were pretty eventful and it made me want to cry again when Neelan met his mom. It was. I don't know what to say, just cherish and love your moms, go up to them right now and say, Mom, I love you and give them a big hug, I think they deserve it. Basically, write the words in the comments. I love you mom. That way you'll show that you really love your mom and that way I'll see that you watch this video to the end. And also let's get 500 likes for a quick continuation. See you later and bye bye.